thanks for coming along to the, this would be the second information processing seminar talk. Um, my name is Daniel Little. I'll uh, be giving this talk. I want to start by acknowledging that the talk is taking place on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and to pay respects to their um, past and present elders. Um, I wanted to give an example of how the topic of this talk, which is change detection, um, has a long history in the oral traditions of indigenous uh, people. So one of the stars in this image is, um, I'm told by Google that it's pronounced uh, Betelgeuse, but I'm told by Tim Burton it's pronounced Betelgeuse. Um, so I use the received Tim Burton pronunciation. Um, Betelgeuse is a variable star and it fluctuates from being the eighth brightest star to about the 20th brightest star over a period of about 40, 423 days. And um, that kind of subtle variation was observed by um, Aboriginal peoples and it was incorporated into their oral traditions uh, that were um, recorded in the you know, greater Victorian desert in central um, Australia. So in one morality tale, uh, Niaruna, who is represented by what we would call the constellation Orion, he's chasing after a group of sisters, um, uh, which are represented by the Pleiades, and his, his fire lust is represented by this fluctuating um, brightness of um, Betelgeuse. And uh, the older protective sister um, uh, in the middle around the uh, Hyades, um, she kind of blocks the fire lust with the, by absorbing it into Aldebaran. And this is a, a kind of morality tale, which is told in the oral traditions. So um, what it illustrates is that, um, well, humans are actually quite good at detecting changes in their environment. And you can contrast this with um, ideas about selective attention and how poor we are at detecting the gorilla uh, in the room when we're attempting to do other things. Um, so there's, I wanted to kind of use this as a way to illustrate this. There's a lot we can actually learn by taking these sorts of oral traditions seriously. Um, although we can't date that particular story, there are other indications from stories which include geological events that uh, can that tell us that the oral traditions have been preserved for thousands of years. So these things, you know, predate the discovery of um, Betelgeuse as a variable star by John Herschel in the 1830s. And, um, uh, and, and perhaps even well before Aristotle, Aristotle declared that the stars were unvarying, oops. Um, so now at the risk of switching from something with quite broad interest that I know little about to a very niche topic that I know a lot about, here's my talk. Um, so I'm gonna be talking today about uh, change detection and uh, two approaches to understanding change detection and how they're related to each other. One of them based on something called systems factorial technology, which I'll inevitably slip into calling SFT, and another one based on the sample size model, which is a, um, a representation of how uh, capacity in visual uh, working memory um, uh, might be limited with uh, the number of objects. So I'm, I'm first gonna talk about a paper which came out in 2022 based on my PhD student, Anthea Blunden's work where we attempted to identify the architecture and capacity of a uh, two location change detection task. I'll give a brief tutorial on systems factorial technology because um, there's at least some people here who might not uh, know about it. Um, so for those of you who do, um, thanks for following along. Uh, and then in the second half of the talk, I'll talk about how we can um, combine SFT with the sample size model to identify different effects of set size, redundancy, and change strength on both the architecture and capacity of um, change detection decisions that go beyond two locations. Okay, so this is based on a paper um, that came out in Psych Review last year. The task is relatively simple. Uh, you're presented with a two item memory array, which is backward masked, and then a probe array is presented, which might contain zero, one, or two changes compared to the memory array. Um, you make a response, so you're given some feedback, and then you progress to the next trial. We're recording um, for those responses the accuracy and the um, response time. And there are two different versions of this task that we used, one in which um, we asked people to detect any change in the probe, and one in which we asked 
people to detect um, only, or to say respond change only when both locations changed. So the first example is an example of what's called an OR task. Um, so you can respond change if either of the um, locations change. The second version uh, is called an AND task. And they use a, a disjunctive and a conjunctive rule respectively. So our um, approach to this was following on from uh, Wilkin and Ma's 2004 paper, who tried to differentiate um, two approaches to integrating information across different locations uh, to in an attempt to differentiate uh, pooled models from independent detector models using ROCs. And as I'll demonstrate um, in the next few slides, that did not work very well. Um, and in fact, Wilkin and Ma's paper is mainly known for the rediscovery of the continuous report task. And that question about differentiating pooled and independent detector models was really set aside um, until uh, I think uh, we kind of picked up on it and tried to um, think about it in a different way and focus on what types of response time predictions would these, type, these models make and can we differentiate um, them that way? And then as a second part to that, we looked at the effect of um, uh, redundant changes on detection, um, which I'll come to in a moment. So Wilkin and Ma, they were concerned with uh, more than just two items, but I can illustrate this easily with uh, two items. They were comparing two models, one of which was called the sum absolute differences model, where uh, detection was based on um, the sum of the strengths at both change locations and um, locations where no change occurred. So in this model, um, uh, the, the varying values given to uh, S for change locations and no change locations um, would be different. Um, these, might, these would come from a signal detection model where the uh, strength at a change location would be greater than the strength of, at a no change location. But the entire decision were based on the pooled um, uh, strengths across both of the locations. So in this example on the left-hand side, where the, um, the left-hand target uh, location is changing quite a lot, you would have a high signal. And um, where there's no change at the left location, it would just fluctuate randomly um, according to some noise distribution. But you would sum these together. So that's the, uh, the SAD model, the summed absolute differences model. And they compared that to a, a different model called the max absolute differences model or the MAD model. So I'll start by thinking about the, this uh, pooled activity in a slightly different way. So um, when there are no changes, you can think about a representation of the pooled activity as, as being kind of a, uh, with two locations, a bivariate normal distribution that we're looking down on. Um, and this, these uh, axes here represent location one and location two. If there's a change at both locations, then we have a different, um, signal distribution, uh, and we can represent that in the same way when there's pooled information at both of the, um, when there are two changes at each location. Uh, we can establish decision criteria and integrate those to, the, to make, a predictions for, make a prediction for the hit rate and false alarm rate for the different types of trials. The maximum absolute difference model it operates differently. It assumes that rather than kind of pooling the information, we're making uh, independent decisions about each of the locations separately. So um, we can represent a decision on the right-hand location by one single detection model and the uh, representation of the, uh, make a decision about the left location from the left um, location model. The, um, the max absolute differences model says that we base our decision on the maximum um, of those two. Um, we make a change response if the maximum of those internal representations exceeds some criteria. And the assumption is that each of those locations is considered independently without pooling and presumably in parallel, although that's not specified directly by this uh, model. So uh, Wilkin and Ma compared the models based on ROCs and um, the, the summed absolute difference models at the top, the max absolute difference model at the bottom. Each one of these panels, um, each one of the columns is a different set of stimulus conditions, which isn't very important. The thing to note is that there's not a lot in this. Um, there's really no qualitative difference in the ROCs between the models. Quantitatively, the results were also mixed. Um, the summed absolute difference model provided a better fit in two out of three of the 
uh, data sets, but the max absolute difference model um, was better in the third one. So the, you really can't draw strong conclusions between the models based on accuracy data on false alarm data alone. What we did um, was apply a different way of thinking about this, which was to consider the um, time course of that each of these decisions would take and then um, design an experiment where we could exploit some of the analysis techniques that are available in systems factorial technology. The key manipulations are that, um, for one, we vary how many changes are in the display. So uh, following a memory item, there might be one change. So an S indicates that the location um, is the same. Um, so on the, the first column, we've got um, the left location doesn't change, but the right location does. Along the bottom row, the uh, left location changes and the right location is the same. The other important manipulation is that we factorially vary the strength at each of those locations to make it either of low discriminability or high discriminability. And the assumption here is that when a, a high discriminability change is going to be faster to detect than a low discriminability change. And that's going to allow us to, to construct a set of analyses that tease apart a bunch of different predictions from a bunch of different models. Uh, and so we're going to focus on examining response time rather than accuracy. So I'm, I'm going to step through some of these ideas uh, slowly. OK, so we did this yesterday where we got rid of this. Um, Screen. Do, we, do you remember how to do it? View thumbnail. Yes. Okay, that's great. Okay, so um, if we take our, our coactive, that's our, our pooled model, um, where each of the changes is being pulled together into some accumulator that accumulator races, and then we make a decision based on the outcome of that. We can construct what's called a survivor interaction contrast, which allows us to generate these types of curves. Uh, which are different in the OR task and the AND task. So the OR task, again, you detect any change. In the AND task, you only respond change if there's a change in both locations. Um, there's a difference between these two curves because of a difference in how you can think about integrating um, the information from the change trials. This isn't super important uh, for this talk, but just to note, that's why there are two different versions of the coactive, one based on the minimum evidence rule where you integrate um, above the boundary. So this is taking into account changes at either location and a maximum evidence rule where you integrate um, only if both of the, in the region where both of the um, uh, items are, or locations are expected to have changed. So they make slightly different predictions, which turns out to be important. Um, incidentally, these two evidence rules, it's been known for a long time that in uh, ROC territory, uh, those are the two lines in the middle, they're basically the same, they don't really make a lot of different predictions when looking at uh, false alarm rates and hit rates. Uh, okay. So we can contrast that coactive model with a parallel model, which is kind of like our maximum absolute difference model where we've got things racing in uh, parallel. And then we take the minimum accumulator time, uh, and that forms the basis of our decision time for the parallel model. And we can think about uh, kind of self-termination in an OR task where you um, terminate your decision as soon as any one of those accumulators is finished. And uh, in an AND task where, you, where both of them, uh, both accumulators have to have finished or you need to change detected in both locations. We can think about exhaustive processing. And these make qualitatively different predictions. So um, before I lose everybody, just by showing you curves, I'm going to take a brief pause and explain where those curves come from and what they mean. OK, so let's start with our RT distributions, which we can represent as a probability density function. We can estimate um, the probability density function by using a histogram on our RT data. Um, which is uh, often uh, positively skewed and uh, truncated at zero. If we integrate that distribution and we plot the value of that integration across values of t, uh, which is time in this case, then we um, get a cumulative distribution function, which represents the probability of observing a random variable that is less than any given time uh, represented by t on the x-axis. OK. If we take that quantity, the cumulative distribution function, 
and we take one minus that quantity, what we end up with is what's called a survivor function. The survivor function tells us the probability of observing a um, random time, which is greater than um, some time on the uh, x-axis. And of course, at the beginning of, of processing, that's always one. Processing hasn't started yet, so we're always going to observe something longer than that. Uh, if we extend the value of time, then uh, that drops to zero. So the survivor function turns out to be important. It's related to the PDF because if we have um, PDFs where there is a single crossover, so you think about you have you might have two stimuli, you have response time distributions for two stimuli, one which is faster than the other, they'll cross over once. Um, another way to say this is the, the likelihood ratio of the, um, the slower uh, to the faster um, uh, distribution is always increasing. If that's the case, then that predicts that the slower process will always the survivor function of the slower process will always dominate or be greater than the faster process. Um, incidentally, the survivor function is also related to the mean of the RT distribution because if you integrate the survivor function above zero, where the the um, response times exist, then uh, that will give you the mean of that distribution. So those relationships between the PDFs, the survivor functions, and the means that form this kind of hierarchy of ordering. Um, and so long as this is the case where we have this dominance relationship, then we can do something um, with that by constructing the survivor interaction contrasts. So if we go back to our full design, the way the survivor interaction contrast works is we construct differences between sets of items. So we start with our, our, uh, our change item, which has low discriminability in both locations. We find its survivor function and we subtract from that um, the low high item, which has a low discriminability in one location, but a high discriminability in the other location. So that forms one part of this um, a, a survivor interaction contrast or SIC equation. And then we take the, the one which is high discriminability on the left, low discriminability on the right, and subtract from that the survivor function where it's high discriminability in both locations. And um, here's the survivor functions for all four items. If we combine them in this way, we get this characteristic uh, interaction contrast for a parallel exhaustive model in this example. And to give you an example about why this, is, this curve is negative, in a parallel exhaustive process, the, um, the response time of two racing um, accumulators where the outcome is generated by exhaustive processing will be the maximum time of any of those processes. So as long as there's any low discriminability information in that um, stimulus or in any of the channels, that's gonna slow down that maximum time. Whereas the high, high stimulus is gonna be still rel relatively fast compared to any of the other three. So the difference, this first difference is gonna be smaller because the maximum time of the low low is gonna be roughly similar to the maximum time of the low high. Um, but the second difference is gonna be large. So when you, when you subtract the large second difference from a small, the small first difference, you get a, a negative value. Um, and that it turns out when you plot that across time, it's negative, um, it never goes positive. It's negative across all of the time. Okay, so that explains the logic for the parallel exhaustive model. There's a um, similar logic for the other models, and I'll, I'll describe, you know, maybe one or two of those in detail. But I just want to point out that the survivor interaction contrast is a generalization of Sternberg's additive factors logic, which is based on tests of, for interactions in response time data um, related to a two-way ANOVA. So, in the classic Sternberg recognition experiment, which some of Adam's students will know about. Um, the kind of key indicator of whether you have parallel or serial processing is whether you have an interaction um, between the uh, set sizes, and the, the mean RTs across set size. Um, so Townsend and Nozawa extended that logic by deriving mean RT and uh, survivor interaction contrast predictions, which differ across serial, parallel, and coactive models. And there's this relationship between the survivor function and the mean, which um, explains why we're using survivor functions in these analyses. 
Okay, so um, here is just uh, kind of a lot of different models that we might care about. One of them is the coactive model. Um, the it turns out that a max model, which just takes the maximum location and processes that the maximum strength signal, also makes predictions similar to the coactive model. Par I've talked about parallel self-terminating and parallel exhaustive. Parallel self-terminating is the reverse of the parallel exhaustive because the the outcomes of that decision are based on the minimum accumulator time. Um, so by the, the same logic, um, you can work out that that should be positive rather than negative. Uh, a serial self-terminating model will terminate as soon as it finds a change. So um, it's only processing one location. So there's actually no difference in, in each of those differences. And uh, so the SIC turns out to be zero across all time. Serial exhaustive model. The integral of this is also zero, but it has this nice property that has an equal negative and positive area. Um, and we developed um, SIC predictions in uh, the Blunden paper uh, for the max model and for what we're calling a max first model, which looks for the maximum target and then processes only that target first in an exhaustive case, then it switches to the less strong target. And that predicts a serial signature, as you might expect but with a constraint on the order of processing. Um, the nice thing about this is that across both the OR and the AND tasks, we get a kind of strong qualitative distinction between a lot of models we might be interested in, which we can then use to just look at our data, do some analyses on our data, and use these non-parametric predictions, predictions to falsify the models, which we can do. So in the OR task, um, the SICs turned out to be um, uh, positive um, without any negativity, although they're so the, the kind of green background here are 95% um, bootstrapped confidence intervals. They are, um, even though there's a, an initial negative deflection, uh, that never turns out to be significant by any of the measures, either using these bootstrap confidence intervals or more sophisticated statistics. Um, in the AND task, we get uh, both a negative and positive deflection and a, a, a mean interaction contrast then of near zero. And so what that looks like to us is that um, the most, the best explanatory architecture is one which is either a max model, which is just takes the maximum signal in the OR task or the maximum signal and processes it first in the AND task, or it's a model where there's parallel processing, parallel self-terminating processing in the OR task, which switches to serial processing in the AND task. Okay, so that's kind of convoluted. We haven't eliminated all of the possibilities, um, but it's, it's nice that we can rule out a bunch of the models based on these strong inference properties of the survivor interaction contrast. The other thing we did in this paper was to try to differentiate those two accounts based on the properties of a measure uh, called workload capacity. And workload capacity falls out of a comparison between the redundant targets where you have two changes compared to the, um, a prediction based on the single targets where you only have one of the locations changing. So um, this measure is based on um, setting the, an unlimited capacity parallel self-terminating model as a benchmark. And the way uh, you compute this is by taking the negative log of the uh, a redundant target, um, so the survivor function for the redundant target change trials, um, and compare that to the product of the survivor functions uh, of the, the single target. So the change on the left, the change on the right, multiplied together, and then you take the negative log. Um, as a technical aside, the negative log of the survivor function gives you something called, gives your quantity called the integrated hazard function. But um, we could think about it as in terms of the integrated log function. It has a nice property that if these two quantities um, are the same, and I'll tell you why that should be in, in a moment, it predicts that this capacity function should equal one across uh, all values of time. Okay, so, um, so a parallel uh, model should predict a capacity function of one. The reason for this is because the, um, the product of the two survivor functions from the single change trials uh, is how you pre predict a minimum time uh, distribution from um, those two single change trials. So the parallel model theoretically assumes that when you have two changes, 
your response time is based on the minimum time. So if you set that equal to the product of the two single targets, those two quantities should be equivalent in uh, the, um, under the assumption of parallel self-terminating processing. Uh, taking the negative log of that quantity then allows you to make that equal one across all time, uh, which is where we generate that workload capacity prediction. Okay, that's what I just said. Um, a serial model predicts that the processing of the double target should be slower than the, the minimum time predicted from the two single targets. So this quantity actually is less than one. So a serial model predicts a workload capacity function of less than one. A coactive model predicts that we should get faster than um, uh, minimum time processing. This is related to the race model inequality. Uh, and consequently, we get a prediction of supercapacity or capacity coefficient, which is greater than one. Feel free to stop me at any time if I'm if you need some clarification. What we observed was that in both a um, ORF task and an AND task, the capacity was limited um, and less than one. And we need an explanation for why that is. We already ruled out serial processing on the basis of the SIC. So uh, there must be something else going on. There was a message a little while ago that Astrid would have an answer. Oh, okay. So Astrid may have a question. Thank for you for you. noting that. Astrid, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? We might have yeah. gone past it. Um, yeah, I had a question about the stimuli that you're using. Um, so because you're using luminance targets and these are, they may not be, um, well, it's, they're kind of, luminance is, forms a logarithmic function. So the, the change that you would detect between a very bright target and a medium sized target is like maybe um, greater. The distance might be greater than if it's between a low lumen, like a low luminance and like a middle one. So I'm wondering if you had considered that in the uh, stimulus selection for this paradigm. So we varied those um, changes so we varied randomly what the target and what the memory probe is. As it happens for this analysis, it doesn't matter all that much so long as that the high changes are always faster than the low changes. So that's the, the kind of key distinction. The actual um, kind of psychometric function that describes the change isn't all that important so long as you're getting that dominance relation in the survivor functions. Okay. But that's a good question. It does that does show up as being extremely important in other cases where it's more difficult to get that relationship. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so capacity is always limited. Um, oh, ours, uh, what we surmised for why capacity was limited was something to do with the assumptions of that capacity coefficient. So. Those workload capacity predictions that I presented depend on this assumption that when you present the left channel by itself, its rate of processing is the same as when you present it in the context of the right channel. So this is a, a, um, an assumption called context invariance. So that, that kind of bracketed two there indicates that we're presenting something else alongside of this um, stimulus. Um, but if that rate of processing of the double target is slowed compared to the single target, so something like this, then um, that will pull capacity lower. Uh, so here's some predictions just uh, demonstrating that that's the case, that uh, capacity goes less than one if you have this sort of relationship in survivor functions. So why might the double target be slower than the single target? Well, we've known for quite a long time that there's something called a double target deficit and then there are costs um, when detecting two simultaneous targets. And this leads now to a discussion of how representations in visual short-term memory are dependent on the allocation of a limited number of discrete samples and something I'm gonna call the sample size model um, after uh, Philip's work. Um, and um, yeah, let me, let me demonstrate how that uh, works in the last part of the talk. So I've helpfully borrowed, borrowed a, an image. Um, the assumption is, is that- It took a certain amount of time to get that image done, so it's nice to be able to reuse it all. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm reusing it in today's lecture. I did see it in today's lecture, yeah. Um, so the assumption is if you, if you have to represent uh, something in visual short-term memory, the way you do that is by taking a 
a discrete number of samples. So at the top, you can think about um, a population of neurons, which are uh, representing some distribution according to a discrete number of samples. Now, if you have a single object, the variability of that object is going to depend on the number of samples that you can take. So what this is indicating is that we're approximating the variability of that distribution um, by through the number of samples that we've taken. So uh, that the standard deviation that we're representing is corrected by a square root of n um, uh, or divided by the square root of the number of samples that we have. What the sample size model says is that if you have multiple objects in the display, the way in which you represent them is by dividing up the, the fixed samples between them. So there's a further correction um, uh, by uh, the square root two um, to the uh, precision with which you can represent each of those objects. So the sample size model suggests that there is a fixed or limited capacity of uh, samples that you can take in any moment in time. When you have multiple objects in a display or multiple locations that you're trying to monitor, you divide up the samples between those locations. So we ran an experiment where we effectively replicated the previous work that we did with two locations, but now we added a set size manipulation on top of that, where um, we included um, set sizes three and four, but now we have single changes um, and, um, and, and double redundant target changes as well. So um, based on work that Philip has done with David Sewell and Simon Lilburn and Lane Corbett, we can generate a number of predictions from the sample size model of what we might expect to see in this experiment. And I, I, I feel it's helpful to point out here, we didn't design this experiment with the sample size model in mind, but as it turns out, it does an incredible job of capturing the data. So that's the kind of the point of this talk that I'm working towards. So in a um, paper, David Sewell, Simon Lilburn, and Philip Smith did a post-queued um, detection task where they presented um, one, two, three, or four oriented Gabor patches, which were masked. And then one of the locations was probed. People had to report that. Um, they varied not only set size, but the exposure duration of the memory um, probe. And what they showed was that the, um, the proportion correct data was well predicted simply by knowing um, the uh, sensitivity or D prime of the single set size. So you could take set size one and correct it by um, for set size one at each exposure duration. I guess, although there is kind of a lawful relationship between exposure duration and um, how D prime changes at set size one. But if you divide by the number of the, uh, the square root of the number of the objects in the display, you can predict these um, curves in almost a completely parametric free fashion, um, which is pretty nice. That's, uh, that's actually um, something which is quite rare in psychology to be able to do. And what that gives us is a prediction for how we would expect performance to change in our experiment as we increase set size. It should follow this kind of um, uh, square root of the number of items correction. We can also um, think about what's the effect of redundant stimulus information. And um, this work uh, was, uh, goes back to Sweats um, and some early work in 1961 on what are called multiple interval experiments, where you don't just get one stab at detecting um, what's going on in the display. And for some of the items, it's presented more than once. And um, there's this nice property, which is that it, you get a, a kind of root two benefit if you have two presentations of an object compared to one presentation. The reason for that is kind of easy to see if you think about um, uh, if you have two changes, one in the first interval, one in the second interval, the distance and, and the kind of distance, uh, the detectability of those is D prime. Well, then the distance between no change and the kind of center of this distribution would have a length of the square root of two, um, which explains kind of where this prediction comes from. Um, uh, Simon Lilburn and Philip Smith followed this up and, and produced an elaborated uh, sample size model, which takes into account both the number of changes in the display and the number of items in the display. And we're gonna build on this um, model as well, uh, because we, we have both a set size manipulation and a redundant target manipulation. 
Um, the other factor, which is the effect of change detectability, remember we're varying whether the changes have low discriminability or high discriminability. So in, in a nice piece of work by Simon Lilburn um, and, and uh, the usual suspects, um, using now not just horizontally or vertical uh, Gabors, but Gabors that could have an orientation um, Again, we have the effect of set size being represented by the number of samples that are used to represent each of the objects in the display being divided up between them. So you have this kind of sample size correction to um, uh, the D prime. But there's an additional effect, which is that the, the strength of the signal depends on how different that signal is from the, um, the kind of target you're looking for. So I think here you have to say whether that the target was uh, vertical, so the degree of verticality would be predicted by these tuning functions and how far um, that stimulus was away from vertical. I might have the details a little bit off there, but... That was correct. Simon did a first experiment where he thought he would make a deviation from 45 degrees, but reasons of, of the nature actually is asymmetry. And it kind of worked out, but it, people found out a really hard judgment. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, uh, it was very... The, the oblique effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so uh, the kind of nice property of this is that the, the stimulus properties, the strength of the stimulus is, is kind of a separable effect to, to the effect of um, set size. And so we can think about an even more elaborated model uh, where we have both the effects of redundancy and set size, but also uh, the effect of stimulus strength, which varies by whether we have kind of high, low, or um, uh, high and low uh, strengths in different combinations. So we're going to represent those strengths by the uh, kind of norm vector length of um, the D primes for the low and the high targets in different combinations. So the A and B here indicate that we can substitute in either lower and high targets in different combinations. So a really nice property of this design is that we're combining the effects of detectability, the effects of redundancy, and the effects of set size um, in a way that allows us to also look at these um, uh, SFT measures. So here are um, average results from four observers. All of the observers were relatively similar. I'll show you individual plots in a moment. But the kind of interesting thing is that we get really lawful effects here. So, uh, if we have one change and it's of low discriminability, um, your accuracy is lower than if it's at high discriminability. If we have redundant um, changes and they're both low-low, that gives you a slight benefit as you start adding in high discriminability changes that improves accuracy as well. Uh, here's just the same plot with D prime. And when we looked at this, we thought, well, this looks remarkably sample size. Uh, and um, what we wanted to do is explore how well that model could predict those results we see similar effects in the response times as well. Um, we developed a model uh, based on the model we introduced, a parametric model that we introduced in the London paper, um, which used the sample size model to constrain how the, um, the uh, D prime changed and was used to drive a coactive accumulator architecture um, across different set sizes, taking into account both the strength of the signal the number of changes in the display and the, um, uh, the set size. And um, we had to also assume that um, the decision thresholds in the accumulator models were changing with set size, they were increasing with set size, which we think is reasonable since participants know the set size prior to seeing the test display. Uh, that allowed us to capture um, the changes in accuracy in D prime, but also the changes in the RTs. Uh, this model fit um, really well. It beat out a number of different comparison models. Uh, you can see that it's really nailing all of the results. Um, I've, I've uh, taken out the effect of um, change strength here just to not clutter up the figure too much. I've averaged over it. Um, here's the next best fitting model. Uh, this was a parallel self-terminating model, again, with a threshold change. Um, this model assumed that there was a variability. Uh, the variability in the signal detection component of the model changed with set size, kind of capturing this idea of variable precision and change detection. Um, and it doesn't do a very good job at all. It's missing um, the redundant uh, target effect. 
um, and it's um, kind of over predicting what happens for um, single changes as well. Uh, so this, this is the next best fitting model. It's qualitatively missing uh, the predictions of the data. Just switching quickly to the uh, SFT predictions, we can look at SICs again. And um, what we concluded was that architecture really isn't changing with set size. This is again, consistent with the max model, um, which was our preferred conclusion from the Blunden paper. Um, an important prediction from the sample size model is that because D prime is based on this combination of both redundancy, so the number of changes and the set size, we should expect to see capacity change as we increase the set size. So um, we're computing capacity now by comparing redundant targets to single targets, but those double targets can come from set sizes two, set size three, or set size four. And what this uh, kind of a priori prediction from the sample size model is that capacity should decrease. And that's what we observed, that uh, capacity becomes more limited as you increase uh, set sizes for both when we look at the high changes separate from the low changes. This is a, a way of summarizing that entire function and just showing that it's decreasing um, in the table. Now there's a, a, a nuanced counter prediction to this or, or auxiliary prediction to this, which is that if we take the cases where we are changing the set size, but we also have a single change, we can compare that to redundant changes from within the same set size rather than from across set sizes like we did with capacity. And this is actually a measure called resilience, which um, uh, I and some colleagues developed in 2015. And what this should predict is that because the set size is the same between the single targets and the double targets, these two values should balance out and cancel out. And consequently, the resilience prediction shouldn't change across set sizes, and they don't, um, except for maybe the high target in set size two. But otherwise, um, they're reasonably overlapped across each of the set sizes, which is another nice a priori prediction uh, that falls out of the sample size model. Okay, so um, to wrap up, the architecture was consistently over additive and doesn't change with set size. Workload capacity decreased with increasing set size in line with what you predict from the sample size model. Uh, detectability, the effects of detectability were completely separable from set size and redundancy in a way that we would expect from previous work. Um, looking at these tuning functions and uh, set size and uh, redundancy and set size cancel out in the resilience function in line again with what you predict from the sample size model. So on the basis of this work, we've got a, a kind of future project in mind where we're looking, um, this is kind of a first step in aligning the sample size model, which is one non-parametric approach to understanding capacity with uh, the workload capacity measure, which is a, a different um, non-parametric approach. Um, and we've, we've thought about ways in which we might think, look at um, what happens if your samples are not divided equally between locations in the task. So you might have attentional biases um, and uh, some of Philip's work has developed an attention weighted sample size model. It would be interesting to look at the processing architecture implications of that. And um, we thought also about how we might combine these continuous response tasks with um, SFT to generate predictions for those as well. So I'll stop there and I'll, I'll take questions, but thanks very much.